Good afternoon. Welcome to The Future of Democracy, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. When we started this experiment, we thought we'd be going deep into interesting side paths and rabbit holes about the ways in which our democracy works. But we found that every conversation has really been about the sometimes subtle, sometimes dramatic shifts in the way that we live and how they have the potential to reorient the trajectory of our democratic society. And so our new title reflects that experience. Uh, and sometimes this future looks very different depending on where you stand. Just a few years ago, the prevailing tone around the country and certainly in, in Washington about the major and growing technology companies was overwhelmingly optimistic. Companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google were providing beloved services. They were shaking up experiences and interactions in ways that we treated as long overdue, and in many cases, liberating in their potential. And they were epitomizing a culture of corporate innovation and domination seemingly worthy of universal emulation. But my, how things have changed. Just yesterday, the top executives of Amazon, Google, Apple, and Facebook faced intense questioning in Congress. And it all boiled down to one big question. Have these companies become too big for our democracy? A few companies have been in the eye of the storm more visibly in recent months than Facebook. Critics have grown increasingly vocal that Facebook actively contributes to corrosive forces in our democracy, like polarization, hate, and misinformation, and have grown increasingly cynical that the company either does not care or actively profits from these ills. In June, a coalition of major brands and advocates launched the most successful advertiser moratorium of a major technology company to date. The hashtag Stop Hate for Profit campaign challenged businesses to abandon advertising on Facebook for a month and ultimately attracted marquee participants like Unilever and Verizon. Earlier this month, in a sign of the campaign's growing strength, Facebook executives met with the organizers to hear their demands. One of those organizers is Free Press, a progressive advocacy organization whose mission is to change the media to transform democracy and realize a just society. Today, I'm going to be joined by Free Press co-CEO Jessica Gonzalez. She is a longtime civil rights advocate working on issues of media and technology. It's going to be an exciting conversation, uh, both about the future of these platforms and technology, but also about the present and what it's been like to interact with Facebook. So please join me in welcoming Jessica to the show. Hi, Sam. So good to be here with you. Thank you for coming. So, so just, just orient us a bit. Uh, Stop Hate for Profit. How did the, the campaign originate? So Sam, many of our organizations have been working to uh, stop hate and disinformation over Facebook for many, many years. So Free Press, for instance, uh, helped co-found the Change the Terms Coalition that actually is, includes over 60 civil rights, racial justice, and digital rights groups that have been calling for several years on Facebook and other tech platforms to strengthen their terms of service strengthen their enforcement of those terms of service and provide more transparency and due process uh, in how they moderate content. And so we've been tracking very closely what Facebook and other tech platforms are doing to keep people safe, to stop hate, to stop disinformation, voter suppression, and other things that are producing great harms to certain demographic groups, but also to society at large. Other partners in the campaign, including Color of Change, uh, the NAACP, LULAC, uh, National Hispanic Media Coalition, Sleeping Giants, ADL, and others have also been tracking this. Sometimes we've been working together, other times we've been tracking on our own. And what we consistently noticed is that while Facebook may have some decent policies on paper, they were actually failing to enforce their own policies. And that at the end of the day, one of the driving business models of Facebook is uh, not only engagement, but the way that divisive content like, like hate and bigotry and racism and disinformation actually increases engagement on Facebook. So that the business model itself is part of the problem. The, the business is designed to foster hate and disinformation and that Facebook wasn't doing enough to stop it. And that in fact, um, you know, we heard in a Wall Street Journal piece earlier this year that Facebook's own research that it hid from the public until Wall Street Journal broke the news shows that 64% of people who find ex 
far extremist content on Facebook are, were driven to that content by Facebook's own recommendation system. And of course, we see bigoted ads, particularly bigoted po political ads that dehumanize groups of people, dehumanize immigrants, black people, and other people based on their demographic characteristics are still quite pervasive on Facebook. So uh, frankly, we were fed up. We were fed up because we've been making calls to action. We've been in dialogue with Facebook and we're tired of the talk. We wanna see them put their money where their mouth is and make the changes that need to happen to, you know, to protect the health and safety of Facebook users and the health of our democracy. So, you know, there's, it seems to me there's sort of two kinds of arguments about the way in which social media, you know, exacerbates some of these challenges, or we believe that it does. One is it, it actually drives profitability, right? That incendiary content, hateful content, that the kind of, the kind of affinity uh, that this, that this channels, the emotions that this channels are the things that make social media appealing and profitable. And then there's kind of a lighter argument that says, like, it may not be sort of the core profitability of the company, but the point is they don't have enough, they don't really have an incentive to stop it. You know, at least the technology makes this easier to do. Um, and, and so the, the company just doesn't have enough of an incentive to stop it. Do you, what's, what's Free Press's take on what the real challenge is here? I think that's exactly right. They don't have enough of an incentive to stop it. Uh, and we heard, uh, we heard Nick Clegg say, even after the meeting that we had with them, that Facebook doesn't profit from hate and it's not good for their business. We heard Mark Zuckerberg say that yesterday in the House Judiciary Antitrust hearing that Facebook doesn't profit for hate or that hate is bad for business. Uh, I think in the long term, I really hope that's true. I actually think it's a very risky business uh, and not sustainable in a long-term way as our society diversifies uh, to trade and profit in hate. But I will say today, they are directly profiting off of hate. And it is, uh, if you're just looking at dollars and cents and not worried about long-term risk or advertising, you know, you know then, then it has benefited them to leave hate up. Um, and what, res what do you think resonated this time with companies? Why do you think so many companies were, there have been other ad moratoria before, uh, YouTube, I think two years ago, there was a, there was, there were big brand safety concerns. What, 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 what resonated do you think with the corporate partners? Well, I, I think it can't be overstated the influence that the movement for black lives and people protesting in the streets about racism, that impact has been incredible we see not just individuals, but companies, governments, organizations, um, you know, scrutinizing what their role has been in oppression, particularly oppression of black people. Um, but like what roles have our institutions played and have we played uh, in and of ourselves in exacerbating or legitimizing or normalizing oppression? I think that is an important thread that I don't want to leave behind uh, in this debate that like we're having a moment of reckoning because of the tremendous organizing that's happening uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, but I think in addition to that, we also brought together a collection of organizations that, that haven't always worked together on this issue. And then the other thing, Sam, is that We've been around the block a few times with Facebook now. We've seen how they play us and we weren't going to let that happen again. We know what their tricks are. They have an appeasement strategy. They talk to all of our groups. They try to pit us against one another. They, try to, they have talking points that can sound very convincing if you haven't done the research and really peeled back uh, and seen what's actually happening on Facebook. Some of their policies are quite good on their face, but they're very poorly enforced. And so they know how to say all the right things and pull all the right levers to take the heat off of them without actually doing the hard work, and it is hard work, that needs to be done to root out hate and disinformation on the site. So we've seen that before, our allies had seen that before, and frankly, journalists have seen this play out before. 
And I just think we were a lot more ready. We were coming in with our eyes wide open. And, and so that's part of it. We were able to really tell the true story of what Facebook has been up to and not be swayed by talking points or other leverage points that they were using. Uh, and then I just think the advertisers, they were ready. I think in addition to the movement for Black Lives, we're all figuring out how to keep each other safe during the pandemic, right? And we, we've seen how disinformation um, about coronavirus is deadly. We see that the disproportionate impacts of the coronavirus fall on black and brown people. I mean, Herman Cain passing, like say what you will about his political positions, it's incredibly sad actually um, that people um, believe that we don't need to take more precautions. And I think Facebook and other companies and, and advertisers were all watching the impacts of disinformation and how it's causing real harm. So I don't think, I don't want to say it's any one thing. I just feel like we were coming to a tipping point um, where a lot of folks were doing internal reckoning, uh, but also just watching the truth play out. Like uh, politicians can tell as many lies as they want, but 150,000 people are dead that that probably didn't need to die and so there's just a lot of contributing factors and I think part of it was that our organizations came ready uh, and that advertisers were doing some introspection do you think uh, do you think that uh, that that um, do you think consumer sentiment is is shifting you know I mean it's interesting that uh, you know a lot a lot of people called you know yesterday's hearing sort of a big tobacco moment for yeah. the, for the, I don't know that it really quite delivered on that, but, but it certainly, I mean, by the, you know, the, the, the moment that everyone was referring to, it's not like anyone thought cigarettes were healthy in the mid nineties, right? That wasn't what shifted, you know, what shifted was, um, you know, a, a generation of young people that, that were not interested in smoking, the same generation that ultimately sustained, you know, bands, you know, restaurant bands and other things that, you know, would have seemed unthinkable, and ended up very quickly becoming the norm. It didn't help that you had Jeffrey Wigand and you had you know the insider um, and these things that were popularizing the whistleblowing. But it it seems to me the culture was shifting, you know. And at some point, um, the the industry had failed to anticipate that change. Is is that what's happening here? Is it that people have a more personal experience of social media? Is it that uh, in, in in the ills of social media harassment, misinformation, hate speech? Is it that people just don't like the services, you know, the way that they used to? And so their tolerance um, when they hear credible accusations that these platforms uh, advance certain kinds of harm, uh, that their tolerance to listen to those accusations is more intense? What, what, do, you, what, what, is, what do you think it is that's sort of shifting the trend? Because this has happened quite quickly. I mean, it was not that long ago that we really held these companies up as just sort of the absolute icons of what, the beginning of, of the, the pandemic. Thank goodness for social media. Everyone yeah. got back on Facebook, right? Um, you know, I think the sea change is real. We saw that in a poll that came out last week from Accountable Tech and GQR that actually polled on people, public opinion of American voters on tech platforms and on Facebook in particular. And I was stunned, frankly, that poll found that 55% of people had heard of the Stop Hate for Profit campaign and the Facebook ad boycott it found that 74% of people, this is across party lines, 74% of people agreed and supported the companies that joined the boycott and that people would be more likely to buy products from companies that took a stand against hate. Um, and it also found that we have about two thirds of American voters who believe that rooting out hate, disinformation and conspiracy theorists from Facebook on Facebook should be a top priority. That is a sea change that's happening. And I'm actually glad you brought up uh, whether this was a big tech's big tobacco moment. I see a lot of similarities there. And I don't know that we got to all of them yesterday or that getting to them in an antitrust context um, is even the right way to go. I think there's a lot more lines of inquiry, including civil rights inquiries that need to be um, focused on some of these platforms. Uh, but, but when I see a number of studies coming out of Facebook, like the one that was re revealed in the Wall Street Journal, but other internal studies about 
behaviors, how Facebook influences people's behaviors, moods, beliefs. We see that they are now going to take up um, another internal review of whether it's algorithms are biased. We, we heard from employees earlier this week that, that um, such studies already existed and that we didn't hear about it. And so I do think people are aware that companies, you know, 71% of people in this poll said that Facebook will put profit over societal good. So people are becoming aware of that dynamic. And I really want to know what do these companies know that we are not being told? If there's internal research about the impact and particularly harmful impacts to our democracy, to our health, to our safety, particularly the health and safety of women and people of color, uh, I want to know about it. And I'm actually really concerned uh, that, that studies that show that the platforms are having negative impacts are being buried. Uh, and so that is the big tobacco moment that I'm hungry for, not just for Facebook, but for a number of these tech platforms. What do you know about how you're influencing society and about the harms that you're bringing to bear? Because that was the thing uh, that was so insidious about big tobacco, right? It wasn't just that they were killing people, it's that they knew they were killing people and they yeah. hit the ball. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I guess I would, I, there are similarities. I mean, I think, I think the idea that um, the companies are aware of the harm, you know, and are, and are seeking to suppress that to avoid public scrutiny and accountability, or maybe aware, you know, I, I certainly see as a similarity. Um, I also think, you know, part of the, you know, part of the challenge with Big Tobacco is it sort of became clear that they weren't dealing with us in good faith. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that is to be true of a lot of corporate actors, but I think is something that, uh, you know, depending on the issue, but it's something that people react to. I guess that what I see is sort of the dissimilarities are, you know, th at the level of one cigarette, you're, you're creating all kinds of externalities, you know, in society. And I think, and so the, the, the thing itself is corrosive to public good, to personal good. You know, the only well being is really the joy that you get in direct exchange for the health consequence to yourself and the externality for someone else, a true vice. And I think with, with social media the, in, 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 and, and, and also e-commerce, I mean, so you have to bring Amazon into this and Apple into this as well. It strikes me that part of the, part, a lot of the harm comes from the necessity for the network service to be large and to be large at a level at which it can't be managed. Like tobacco executives need you to want to smoke. I get the sense sometimes that the technology executives just kind of wish, you know, that these problems would go. It's not that they want polarization in part, they just wish it would go away. They, they, they just, they wish this just wouldn't be a part of the, the platform. I think I agree with you. That's sort of, you know, you can't really wish for that. The question is, if you create a technology that enables that, that accelerates that, and then therefore you have some social responsibility for it. But I, those are sort of the dissimilarities that I see. And so to that extent, I do agree with you, like figuring out, what policy mechanism you use to get at that is going to be pretty critical um, at the end of the day. What are, so let's get into that. What are, what are some of the demands that you all have, have levied on the companies and how have they responded to them? Now you've, you've now had conversations with the top executives at Facebook. How have they responded to the different things that you've asked them to consider? So you can find our demands at stophateforprofit.org. Um, but I will go through a few of them here. So we did ask for a, a, an executive level civil rights expert who can do a full uh, internal, you know, oversee internal civil rights practices at Facebook. We asked for them to audit uh, their current content moderation system for bias. We asked for them to strengthen their content moderation policies. And there we specifically cited the Change the Terms Coalition's model corporate policies to disrupt online hate as a model. Um, and those policies call for a ban on hateful activities. They call for much more robust investment in the enforcement of those policies. They call for greater transparency about what's happening with content moderation because we do need, as the public, we need to have the sunlight to figure out what's working, what's not working as we all balance free expression and safety and, and privacy and all those important values. Um, and we also, you know, we also called for, for rights of appeal so that if folks get content taken down, there is a process 
um, that a human that can come to a human moderator because sometimes machine machines make mistakes, right? Uh, and we know that algorithms have do have bias. That's the the Sophia Noble's great piece on algorithms yeah. of oppression taught us that. And many other uh, scholars have looked in into that issue. Um, so the other things we're calling for is are stopping the amplification and recommendation system that continues to recommend and amplify white supremacists, conspiracy theorists, and people whose sole purpose is to spread disinformation on the site. We're calling for a ban on white supremacists, conspiracy theorists, and, and disinformation spreaders if they routinely engage in that sort of uh, behavior, uh, and a number of other calls that you can find at stophateforprofit.org. How did how they react? Like, what, what, what did you perceive their attitude to be when you actually met with executives? The meeting was so awkward, Sam. <laughs> like, we had given them our demands three weeks ahead of time. It's not a long document. It's three pages long. And mind you, many of these, many of the demands had been before the company for a really long time, years and years. We've been in dialogue with them about what we needed to see out of the company to uphold civil and human rights. And so we got to the meeting and they seemed very impressed with themselves that Mark Zuckerberg was at the table and that we ought to just be thrilled to have a conversation with Mark Zuckerberg. We had come expecting them to actually have some responses to the requests that we made. And instead they want us to, them, they wanted us to walk through what we'd already put out there. So that was really disappointing. We did spend some time uh, talking about the harms of the current system. They talked a lot about how great they're already doing at removing hate and disinformation. You know, I think they had that talking point on 64 point font. Um, but then we laid out, well, here's the instances where it's not working. So you may be catching some things, but there's still a lot of really harmful content out there. Uh, and, I, and I did, personally, I talked about um, the UN finding that Facebook played a determining role in the genocide in Myanmar. Yeah. And that I really pressed Mark Zuckerberg to take a deep reflection on the role that his platform is playing in legitimizing, facilitating, and normalizing mass atrocities like the one in Myanmar and, and reminded him that mass atrocities are not exclusive to Myanmar. They're happening all over the world, as close as our home state of California, where we have an atrocity happening on the US-Mexico border, where our kids are being removed for the, from their mother's arms and separated from their families. And, and we have you know, children in cages and that uh, you know, I've heard Mark Zuckerberg talk a lot that he cares about immigration rights and immigration reform, the rights of refugees, and that this is something really harmful um, that's happening right here. I talked a bit about uh, what happened in El Paso last year. We're coming up on the, ma the, the anniversary of that massacre, and the shooter in his manifesto invoked the same language about immigrants and brown people as invaders, as an invasive species, as, as like subhuman, right? Um, something we've been battling in the Latinx and immigrant rights community for a long time. And those, that type of language was running in political ads, thousands and thousands of political advertisements that were running on Facebook at the time and were heavily in heavy rotation in Texas in particular, um, you know, led up to this person who went to the Walmart with the specific intent to kill brown people and to kill immigrants. Um, and so I asked him to reflect on that and to really take an honest look at how Facebook is being used to legitimize mass harm. How did he and respond to that? You know, it's, that was the moment where I felt like he didn't really have a response. He, he seemed to be listening. I think it shook him a bit. Uh, but again, he didn't respond with policy changes. Uh, we still haven't heard significant policy changes. We've heard a few things around the edges. They did agree, for instance, to bring on someone at a vice president level to work on civil rights internally. That was not the executive sweet hire that we hope to see. We really wanted someone with the power 
and the influence to really move things at Facebook. Um, but it is something we saw them uh, last week commit to doing some internal auditing. I think if that auditing is actually released to the public and done in a transparent way, that could lead to meaningful movement. But again, these are not we want, I want to see a yes on our system will stop recommending and amplifying white supremacists and conspiracy theorists. I want to see a yes on yes, we're going to update our policies. Um, you know, we got some commitment that they would beef up enforcement. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg made that announcement right after we launched uh, about a, you know, a little over a month ago. Um, but, but we need to see firm commitments and timelines when this is gonna be implemented. And we need to know that the public is going to be able to see what Facebook is doing, that they're not gonna do more internal studies behind the scenes that we may or may not learn about or that we have to learn about through leaks. Yeah, I mean, what, do you, I mean, do you believe, do you, are you optimistic that there's gonna be meaningful reform without being compelled to do so? One, and two, is this, is this a reform problem? Can, can Facebook actually reform its systems and practices to solve this problem? Or is the problem that uh, uh, a, a social network based on recency and popularity that has billions of daily users is gonna be, is gonna be an accelerant for this kind of harm? Sure it can, sure it can, if it wants to. It, it absolutely is in the power of Facebook to do this and to do this in a, in a careful way. That's why we have at Change the Terms, we have those model policies. We think that is the way for Facebook to balance all the competing interests that it needs to balance here. Of course it can. It hasn't shown that it wants to. And you know, I, I, we need more than the breadcrumbs and that's what we're asking for. Uh, whether or not they move, they move, I think that's, a, that's an important question. And look, this, there are, there are multi-layered problems at big tech platforms, not just at Facebook, that are going to require multi-layered solutions. I'm glad that we're looking at antitrust and whether uh, these companies are behaving in anti-competitive ways. I think we also need privacy legislation. We need to look at our tax system. There's serious labor rights questions that are coming up, particularly with Amazon, but not exclusive to Amazon. I mean, very concerned about the state of content moderators at Facebook. Most of that work is outsourced to independent contractors. And we're, we heard last year from a couple of pieces in The Verge that a lot of those people are working in some very horrific yeah. uh, working conditions. So there's, there's a lot of problems that we have to face. And I think we need multi-layered solutions. But look, the interesting thing that's happened in the past month or so is that we're seeing other companies step up to the plate. We saw Reddit do a wholesale reform of its policies and add some really good language um, around what it means to be engaged in hateful activities on Reddit. We're seeing Twitter uh, step up to the plate. I think, listen, I think all the companies have a lot of work to do, but what it shows me is that if they have the will to change, they can, and they can do that and still be a platform that has wide engagement and that we are engaging in ways that advance civic dialogue and engagement. I think it's completely possible for that to happen. We're seeing other companies do that and Facebook's behind. So a lot of people in the comment section are asking about what's, what's next for the campaign, especially as the, you know, we get to the end of the month. So what's next? <laughs> Listen, you know, we, we, we had great success. We had over, uh, we've had great success. It's not over yet. We've had over 1,100 advertisers join us. Many of those advertisers are telling us that we're going to stick, they're going to stick with us, that they're disappointed that Facebook hasn't done more. We're incredibly grateful um, for that support. Uh, we are also going to be launching in the UK soon. There's been incredible international interest in this campaign. In the past couple of weeks, I've talked to people in Canada, Brazil, uh, Argentina, Mexico, Spain, uh, Germany, like UK. Like I'm, I've, I've talked to folks um, in many different places that are very interested in this, that are feeling the societal impacts of Facebook in their regions and want to step up. So I, I, the, the pressure will continue. The focus on Facebook and the analysis of Facebook will continue into, into August. 
Um, and we appreciate all the companies that came, you know, paused for July and that are sticking with us until we see significant change from Facebook. What's, and what's the state of this field? You know, I'm, I, you know, what, what, where are we in the maturity in the mainstreaming of a, of a, of a movement? Like I, you and I were talking before the show, like I'm trying to figure out, are we in the revolutionary fringe fervor of 1850? You know, are we in the awareness raising of the 1890s to 1900s? Are we in the institutionalization of 1915 to, you know, where do you, where do you think we are as a, where, where are you all as a movement? And then where are we as a society? Uh, I, you know, I think awareness raising never ends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's been tremendous to see the public opinion shift on this issue. You know, I think you know, Sam, but the audience may not know. I've been doing anti-hate work for well over a decade now. Uh, the first question I used to get when I would talk about the need for companies um, to be more responsible about their hate, the hate speech that runs over their platforms was, what about free expression? And I think what's been remarkable in this period is we're actually having a conversation about the power dynamics behind free expression and how the free expression of white supremacists silences women, silences people of color, and makes it actually more difficult for us to engage in robust debates about the issues that we need to be in robust debate about and how there's actually a very intentional, sophisticated strategy from white supremacists and conspiracy theorists and spread people who spread hoaxers. The very point is to get women, to get people of color, to get gay folks to shut up. They don't want to hear from us. And so we have to consider the power dynamics. We have to consider um, how those movements work to suppress the voices of people who have been historically oppressed in our society. And that's the conversation we're happen having now. That's the conversation we need to have, but we haven't had. Um, and so that's really exciting to me. I do think, um, I do think there's real momentum to institutionalize the conversations that we're having. The deepening of understanding of these issues in the American public is incredibly important. I've always thought cultural change, you know, and some of our greatest leaders have shown us cultural change um, helps with policy change and institutional change. And so, yes, I do think we're gonna see more and better policies, not just from Facebook, but from other tech platforms. And I hope that we're gonna see some structural legislative and regulatory change to hold these companies accountable to the people in the years to come. Well, let's let's talk about that for just a minute before we let you go, because I whether whether it was the, whether whether it would be remembered as the big tobacco moment or not. Yesterday was certainly a milestone. It struck me for you know a few reasons. I mean, I think one, um, as you know from your years working, I mean that's a committee serving notice for sure uh, about mm -hmm. what its what its appetite is on an issue. Um, you know, two, um, the the I it, it, but the, one of the prevailing sentiments that I noticed in the kind of the 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 reactions the 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 reactions today was um, how far Congress has come as a legislative body. I mean, it was you know only a, you know a couple of years ago that I think Senator Orrin Hatch betrayed that he didn't realize you know that advertisers were the economic engine of of social media, and now. Uh, you had sort of much more, in general, sophisticated questions about the business dealings of these of these companies, and then three. And this actually is something people haven't been talking about is um, the, the the despite a frontal assault on perceived anti-competitive behavior by these companies, there was not a spirited defense of of uh, of sort of the evolution of competition to be more focused on consumer welfare. Um, Republican members in particular seem to be focused on focused on other issues and whether they're being censored and and so but uh, so you had you had a fairly one sided actually discussion about the future of this part of the economy so what do you you know again we're in just day one reflection but are there are there things that you heard yesterday that give you hope about where where you think um, we will go from a policy perspective and then. What are there things you heard yesterday that help you to understand the work we still have to do, you know, to be able to, uh, as a society, manage this technology effectively? 
The main thing that gives me hope is I, I thought that Democrats were very organized. It was a well-run hearing. They asked good questions. They came with their research ready to go. I thought that part was excellent. Uh, the thing that gives me the most hope is that uh, those companies were called to testify in the first place. Yeah. I think we need to make that a regular practice. Uh, these, these guys are bo- behemoths now. And I do think they need to be accountable to the American people. And one way they do that is by showing up and answering questions before Congress. I think there's a lot of questions that remain unasked about the civil and human rights implications of these companies that we really ought to examine in in future hearings. I hope that uh, all of those tech CEOs and others start to get called up to Congress on a regular basis. Uh, I was I was unimpressed with um, with their defense, frankly. I, what I heard were some new instances of what seems to be anti-competitive behavior, which I'd like to hear more about. I think another thing that wasn't, you know, wasn't featured prominently was the privacy. You know, it did come up a bit, but the privacy concerns that people have about these companies and the trade-offs that we're making in that space. I think there's lots of questions about whether these companies are giving back to society at the level that they're extracting from us and whether they're paying sufficient taxes. As you know, um, one of Free Press's main concerns with big tech platforms is that they are they have taken a lot of the ad revenue that traditionally went to journalism. And so not only are they spreading disinformation at a rapid pace, at a pace we've never seen before in society and around the globe, but they're also extracting dollars from the industry that we count on to correct misinformation, to, to report the truth, to let us know what's happening in, in our communities. And so We've been, we've been a big fan of, of loving a, a platform ad tax that would uh, invest in local, independent community journalism, uh, journal, journalism that ha, you know, is led by people of color and those who are often the targets of the misinfor- misinformation campaign. So, and I think there's so many other great ideas out there that have yet to be fully explored by that committee or by... Uh, fully vetted, you know, and that we ought to be getting together and talking more about what are the problems we're seeing from our various corners of the world? What are some ideas for solutions and how do we get there? Because I do think there is, you know, what what yesterday taught me or, or reinforced is that there is actual hunger for accountability, both in Congress, but, you know, going back to the polling data that was released last week from the American people. The American people are really fed up with rampant disinformation and hate. Um, they, they're fed up with polarization. They're fed up with um, the divisiveness. And, you know, we have, we have to be able to talk even when we disagree. And when we're all in our own little bubbles, that becomes a lot more challenging. So I do feel there's an appetite um, to move the ball in the right direction. So just maybe a last question for you. I mean, if you were, if you were, you know, sitting, sitting on the dais and as a, as a member of Congress, looking at them on Cisco WebEx or what I think, which I think is the software they used, you know, what, what, what's a question that you wish had been asked? What would you have asked if you were there uh, uh, yesterday? Who? let me get my, let me get my list. Um. <laughs> Number one question. Top Number one. Oh yeah. Well, uh, I want to know what they know about how their platforms are being used to harm people. I think there's a lot the American people don't know. And I wanna know what they know about that. Uh, I, I probably would, you know, had I known this question was coming, I might've had a sharper response, but I guess no. that's the one that hits me in the gut. We keep it, we're keeping it fresh. Uh, well, you can, you can list all your other good questions on your Twitter feed, which for those of you who wanna follow Jessica, it's at Jago for justice. Uh, you can go to visit free press at freepress.net. Um, we will also send out the link to the, to the campaign if you want to learn more about hashtag stop uh, hate for profit. Uh, and as always, this will all come to you uh, after the show. But Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Sam. It was good to talk to y'all. 
Good to talk to you too. And before we go, I want to share some exciting news about what's coming up uh, on the future of democracy. Uh, not only have we changed our name, but we are now available as a podcast. New episodes. So this episode, for example, will drop tomorrow. They will always drop on Fridays. And you can subscribe right now on Spotify or Stitcher. You can also find all previous episodes on Spotify uh, and Stitcher and will soon be on uh, other, other platforms as well. So if you prefer to watch the show while walking outside with a mask or while walking inside with a mask or while cooking, while wearing a mask, just head over to Spotify or Stitcher and subscribe to the show to get new episodes automatically when they drop. We also have some great upcoming shows. Uh, next week, August 6th, we will have Lulu Garcia Navarro the host of Weekend Edition on NPR. On July 13th, we'll be hearing from Yuval Levin, leading conservative commentator. And on August 20th, we'll be hearing from civil rights icon, Wade Henderson, the past president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Um, as always, you could just email us uh, at vision.kf.org or visit us on Instagram. And please stay for 30 seconds to take a two question survey. Uh, and we will end the show, as always, to the sounds of Miami songwriter Nick County. You can find his music on Spotify. Until next week, thank you for joining us and stay safe.